By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we are going to look at an old school magic match between Thomas from Poland. He's playing blue-white control and he is playing against my mono green deck. And the funny thing is this deck used to be a green budget deck, but some of these cards have just exploded in value. So they're no longer really budget, which really, really annoys me because I want it to be a budget deck. Anyway, we're going to discuss that in the deck tech. I'm not going to do that right now. Um, before I jump into that deck tech section of the video, I would first like to point out that um, this video, like every video, also has timestamps. And what that means is you can go to the description below and there you will find several timestamps. One of those timestamps reads MTG Games. If you click on there, that will take you straight to the games of this video. I know that some of you enjoy just going straight to the games and check out the deck tech section afterwards. Um, now there's one other thing that I'd like to point out before we go to the deck tech, and that is that Thomas is a brand new patron to the show. Thank you for supporting me, Thomas. And the cool thing is if you become a patron um, at a certain tier level, you can actually play against me and we can also make an episode together like this one. So if you, if you think, hey, that's something for me, I'd like to do that, I'd like to show my deck, on Timmy Talks, check out the Timmy Talks Patreon page. Uh, click on there and maybe it's something for you, maybe not, but um, have a look, I would definitely appreciate it. And as for now, we are going to start with the deck decks. I'm gonna start with the deck of Thomas. Let's take a look at his blue-white control list. And here we see the deck of Thomas. Now, this really reminds me of the deck, especially those three JM Day Tomes main. So, you know, the deck, of course, is the Brian Weissman ultimate control deck where you know you try to win with card advantage mainly so that's why there are a lot of gem day tomes but this deck is a little bit more aggressive right we see four surrender Afrits in this deck so the three four flyer from Arabian Nights one blue and two to cast and it deals one damage to you during your upkeep so he'll probably want to just get that out early put some game pressure on the opponent so the opponent's kind of focused on that and in the meanwhile he wants to try to get his counter magic up he wants to solve any possible problems with disenchants and swords and later in the game drop his dm day tomes try to get some card advantage going and then he's playing with uh three kind of beefcakes in the deck right air elemental sarah angel and a card i'm really scared of in this matchup triskelion because triskelion is super good against my green stompy deck because my deck is full of one toughness creatures this is a serious problem you know, luckily he's only playing with the one-off, but I do find it interesting, right? Just to put one trike in there, I kind of like it. I, I usually like decks where you put a couple of one-offs in because it just creates a surprise effect for your opponent. And I think trike in this deck is definitely a surprise effect. Now we also see some power in this deck in the form of a, of a time walk. So that's pretty cool. We also see a mana drain and four counter spells. There also is a chaos orb in this deck. Um, so yeah, I mean, oh, and of course we see the mox in there at the right top. I do know that uh, Thomas hasn't played a lot of old school yet, uh, but obviously he does have a pretty cool collection. So this is uh, this is quite impressive. I also like the single spell blast in the deck, by the way. And there we see a little bit of a splash for green in the form of regrowth. That's kind of an interesting decision that he put that in. Let's see how that kind of turns out. If he can uh, if he can find his regrowth, I probably wouldn't splash the regrowth in this deck. Although it's a very powerful card, but also because he doesn't have ancestral recall. I think I would rather splash just the boring black splash with Demonic Tutor and Mind Twist because of that Mox Jet. But, um, you know, that's just me. So uh, we'll just have to see when we look at the games how it's going to work out with the regrowth. I don't have his sideboard on this picture, so we'll just have to do with this uh, with the main 60. Beautiful deck, Thomas. Uh, looking pretty powerful. Let's take a look at my list, Green Stompy. And here we see my deck today, Green Stompy. And I think the keyword of this deck is consistency. Right, I talked about that I like to see one-offs in decks, but for this deck, it's not really gonna happen. I do have one one-off, by the way, which is Hurricane and Soaring, of course, because it's restricted. But with this deck, you wanna go consistent. I just wanna drop creatures, turn one, turn two, turn three, turn them sideways and attack with them, right? We see four Scavenger Folk, four Crypt Sprites, four Lanaware Elves, four Argovian Pixies, four Urnum Jins, four Mishra's Factories, all creatures, they're all just gonna attack. Right? I do have a little bit of a different plan in here as well, because I always kind of like to have layers in a deck, which is my Ank of Mishra Ice Storm plan. Ice Storm, one green and two to cast for a sorcery that destroys any one land, right? So if I can get a Lunar Elves turn one, I can play my Ice Storm turn two, and I can kind of 
get ahead in game on tempo. Then I want to play my Ankh of Mishra, and Ankh of Mishra is an artifact that reads Ankh does two damage to anyone uh, who puts a new land uh, uh, into play, right? So if you play a land, you, you take two damage. So if I can kind of, you know, destroy his lands with ice storms and put pressure on him with my creatures, he's kind of forced to play out lands to try to play out spells or, or creatures to kind of stop my army. But while he's doing that, he's also taking damage because for every land he plays, he's going to take two damage with the Ankh. And obviously, when you look at my deck, I just don't need a lot of lands. So I'm, I'm cool with that. I've got no problem. Now, um, in the introduction, I said that this used to be a budget deck, and it really, really was. The problem is there are three Berserks in here. Now, Berserk is just a super powerful card that I think has to be in here. It's one green, and you know uh, what it does, it doubles target creature's power, and it gives that creature trample. And uh, if it's attacking, it destroys it at the end of the turn, right? So for example, if I attack with my 4 or 5 Urnum Jin, it makes it an 8-5 Trampler, right? So that's, of course, fantastic in a deck like this because you want to deal as much damage as quickly as possible. It also works together really, really well with Pendlehaven and Giant Grove. So for example, I can use my Pendlehaven on my Script Sprites, make it a 2-3, put a Giant Grove on there, make it a 5-6, uh, then put a Berserk on there, and all of a sudden I've got a 10-6 trampling creature attacking my opponent through the air, no less. So that's kind of insane, right? So if I can get that going, but Berserk now, I think the cheapest Berserk here in, in, in Europe at the time of recording, so it's, um, uh, what's the date today? It's May something, half May. Um, at the time it was around 100 euros per copy, right? So I can no longer call this deck a budget deck, unfortunately. And I do think uh, that the Berserks really have such a value that it's going to be hard to cut them. Like I can see, for example, taking the Ice Storms out, which are also quite costly, and um, replace them with, for example, a Crumble. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I, I don't really see an alternative, a good alternative for the Berserks. Uh, another card that's quite costly as well Sylvan Library in here. Sylvan Library is purely in here just for the card draw one. Um, the thing with this deck is you run out of cards in hand very, very quickly. You kind of burn through them like crazy. And, and hopefully in that process, I can find a Sylvan and I can uh, exchange some lives for extra cards. You know, that would be really, really sweet. I also have a sideboard with this deck and um, I'm just going to show it to you. Let's, let's have a look that I can put it on the screen. So this is the sideboard here. So I've got four Whirling Dervishes. Of course, they're really good when I'm playing against black, but also when my opponent wants to board in a city in a bottle, I can take out my Urnums. I do think it's kind of difficult for my opponent to really make a decision because I'm not really afraid of city in a bottle because it only hurts my Urnums. And of course, it's not ideal, but I've got enough other ways to kind of win the game. It's just four cards in my deck. So it's not the end of the world. Um, I'm also playing with uh, three Crumble. So Crumble is one of these cards that I'm sometimes thinking about taking out the Ank of Mishra's and just putting the Crumbles in because the Ank of Mishra plan doesn't always work. But Crumble just seems like such a powerful card in a format where you've got a lot of mocks in and I don't want my opponent to ramp up. And also you've got a lot of Mishra's factories, which are super annoying for me when I'm attacking, you know, because I've got a lot of 1-1 one -one creatures or like creatures with a lesser toughness and you know, Factory can pump itself, make it 3-3, three, three, so it, it's kind of complicated, so I'm really tempted to maybe put the Crumbles in main. Let me know in the comments, if comments below if you would do that. Um, and that's kind of, those are kind of the cards that I wanted to highlight here in the sideboard. Maybe um, it's also nice to talk about Stormseeker. Stormseeker is really good against, for example, my Timmy Spellbook deck, right? Decks that want to just draw cards all the time. Stormseeker is a fantastic finisher against those decks, and I love playing Stormseeker. Uh, after somebody's just cast an Ancestral Recall, right? Because usually they pass turn and in your upkeep, they say, okay, cast Ancestral Recall. And, you know, they fill their hand and they feel really good. And I can go like, okay, whatever, man. I can like cast a Stormseeker and uh, yeah, and make them pay for all that greedy card draw. So it, it can be a really, really cool card. But um, it's in the sideboard because against a lot of decks, it doesn't do much. But it's good against some of the decks. Anyway, um, this is my deck. We've looked at the deck of my opponent, Thomas. So that means we're ready. Let's go to the games. Game number one, here we go. So we've got Thomas on the left, he's on the play. I'm sitting on the right, of course, with the Timmy playmat. Oh, look at this opening. Wait a minute, surrender for free turn one, what? This is bad. Remember, I'm playing mono green. I've got no swords, I've got no nothing. 
There's a Lana Rell's turn one. Okay, that's not really great. I was hoping maybe to have a Berserk in hand, let him pass, and maybe Berserk the Surrender. Taking six, I understand, but then at least this creature would be gone. And uh, we see Thomas taking a damage here. And is he going to attack? He can deal five damage. Going to play a Plains first. What is he going to do? I mean, yeah, of course he's gonna attack with the Surrender. But I wonder if he wants to play something like a four drop. Let's just wait and see what he's got here on his mind. There we see a Felwer Stone. Oh, changing the mana he's tapping for that. Okay, playing a Felwer Stone. He probably wants to keep the blue source open. Uh oh, is this another Surrender Perfreet? Oh, that's six damage next turn. I mean, okay, I'm dropping to 17. This this first game could be over very quickly, ladies and gentlemen. This is a horrible start for me. We can really see that the force of the Urnims. Tapping three. What do I have? I've got a nice storm. Probably going to go for the factory here. Kind of force trying to uh, stop the bleeding. But that means I'm still taking six damage next turn. Of course, Thomas is taking two damage as well. So as you can see, I'm also tracking his score. Mainly because he's got like smaller dice. There we see a City of Brass. Tapping. Th Whoa, another one. This is insane. I'm dead. I'm so, so dead. Attacking for six. I'm going to drop to 11. Next turn he can attack me for nine. So I've got two more turns. And Thomas is on 17, it seems. Yeah, he's on 17. He's going to drop to 14. Uh, what can I do? Maybe play a land? Tech with factory? Hopefully he blocks and I've got a growth or something? Okay, there is a Mishra's factory. Gonna tap two. Gonna play an Argovian Pixies. Gonna tap two. I'm gonna play another Argovian Pixies. Sylvan Library. Oh, that Sylvan is not gonna... Well, maybe it's gonna help me to find a Berserk. I... But that's not even going to help. Three cards in hand. Thomas is on 17. He's going to untap. He's going to drop to 14. And he can hit me for 9. And I'll drop to 2. Wow, look at that. 9 points of damage. This is such an insane start by Thomas. Finding all those surrenders. Turn 1, turn 2, turn 3. This is just insane. So I've got the Sylvan Trigger. Obviously, I cannot draw any extra cards or I'm dead. So I'm just going to draw the one. Maybe if I can find a Giant Growth and a Berserk, actually, I could win this. Let's see if I can make that happen. So animating it, no, I've got no green. So I guess I don't have anything. At least I can deal seven points of damage. So he's going to drop to seven. I'm actually getting pretty close because that means he's going to drop to four. So a Berserk actually would have been enough here. Well, a Berserk and a Giant Grove. I've got to be realistic. Anyway, I am dead. I'm dead to the Serenips. Boom. That was brutal, man. And a really nice uh, showcase of how powerful those Serenip Afrits can be. You sometimes forget because there are just so many weapons against them. But Wow. Man, this was bad. Anyway, I'm going to dive into my sideboard and um, we'll catch back up with you in game number two. Game number two, here we go. So, wow, that game one was fast. At least I'm on the play, which is something. I think maybe Thomas is taking a mulligan. Maybe we're waiting. Yeah, so he's taking a mulligan here, putting a card on the bottom. So then he's going to go to, yeah, he's got six in hand, I believe. And I'm starting here with a script sprites and a pass. Okay, so I can start dealing some damage early on. Let's hope Thomas doesn't have that explosive start again. Uh-oh, there's a Mox Jet. There's a Soul Ring and a Felwer Stone. No lands though from Thomas. Interesting, and that's kind of tough against me because I'm playing mono green, so I'm not playing with any City of Brasses. Like Felwer Stone is super powerful when you're playing against um, a City of Brass. There is a Plains, though, from Thomas, so he does have some options. Maybe he's got a Swords in hand. Wonder if he's going to use it against my Sprites. Here I go, 40 attack, so it's a 1-1. And Thomas is going to drop here to 19. 
And I'm playing a Mistress Factory, but no creatures, no Argovian Pixies or Scavenger Folk or anything. That's kind of bad news for me. I just want to drop those creatures early on. But also, Thomas doesn't find a Serendip. There is a Forest tapping three here. Are we going to see an Ice Storm? I could go for the Blue Source or the White. Both is kind of tempting. I guess I want to go for the Blue so that he cannot cast a Serendip of Freet. Yeah, going for the blue here. And also, of course, he cannot counter when he doesn't have any blue mana. So I'm going to attack here. It's going to drop to 18. But those Surrendips, they really scare me after that game one. So I want to kind of contain the blue sources if possible. Thomas here drawing his card for turn. I mean, he's still pretty light on, on his colors, right? He only has one white, has no blue sources. I wonder what he can do. Just passing turn. This is really good news for me. I wonder if I'm going to attack with the uh, factory or am I going to play out maybe an Urnum? Tapping two green. No, untapping. First attacking. That makes sense. So Thomas is going to drop to 17. Then I'm going to play an Argovian Pixies. And I'm going to play a Sylvan Library. Okay, so this is pretty good. Sylvan right now is super because I'm still in 20. There's no pressure from Thomas. So I can start cashing in my life for some extra cards. Put some more pressure on it. Hopefully find maybe some Giant Growth, maybe an Urnum or something. I mean, Thomas is still pretty high on life. He's on 17 still. Finding a second White Source. If you could find like a Sarah Angel, that would be a big problem for me. So looking at the top three cards, I'm expecting to take an extra one here. Exactly. Going to drop to 16, so drawing an extra. So four cards in hand now. Ooh, it looks like I'm going to attack here with the factory. Animating the factory. Look at that swinging in. I can pump the factory as well. Then I can deal six points of damage. It looks like Thomas wants to respond those Swords to plowshares on my factory. In response, I'm going to pump it, so I'm going to take three life. And I can use that life, of course, to draw an extra card again with my Sylvan Library. So this is not the end of the world. Also tapping a green. Am I going to... Oh, I'm playing a Giant Grove here for some extra damage. Does Thomas have another Swords in hand? Oh, he does! Okay, so this is a bit of a miscalculation on my part. I was hoping that he didn't have that. Do I have something else to play? Tapping another one, another Giant Grove, but on the other uh, creature, Argovian Pixies. Now that Thomas has tapped out, I know that at least that Giant Grove is safe. So I'm going to deal five points of damage to Thomas. He's going to drop to 12. And um, that's kind of okay, but I've lost a lot here. That, that, that second sword was really nice, two for one. Also lost, of course, my factory. So this is not too bad for Thomas here. He's still on 12. If he can just find a strong creature. Okay, there's the City of Brass giving him access to blue mana again. If he's got his Surrendip. So we're talking about some of the scenarios. What is the right timing to play a Swords? Or a Disenchant for that matter. It's always kind of tricky. And I think I'm saying, like, one of the options you could have done is just wait for the damage and see if I would pump the factory. Then in response to the pump, you could have played... Ooh, Time Walk! That's kind of nice. You could have played your swords, but then again, you know, it's it's one life. Maybe I wouldn't have pumped it, but I wanted to use that mana some other way, so it's it's kind of difficult. Anyway, a Thomas taking an extra turn, just finding a Felwer Stone, though, and passing. So, really good news for me. We see zero creatures on the side of Thomas. So no Surrender Pafrits in, uh, in this match, which is really good for me. Taking an extra card, going to 16, playing a Forest, animating, attacking for 4 here. So that means Thomas is going to drop to 7 if he doesn't have anything, like no Disenchants or Swords. No, he does not. Let's see if I can play something second main, playing a Lanawar Elves. Only one card in hand for me, though. And I burned through the Giant Groves. Obviously, you kind of want to keep Giant Grove in case your opponent plays a big creature like a Surrender or a Sarah, or you want to keep it and combine it with a Berserk. There we see a Surrender Djinn. But I think it's probably too late here. 
Because if he attacks with a Serenip, he's opening himself up. But if he doesn't attack, he slowly dies because he's already on 6. For example, now a Giant Growth would have been really nice. I could have just kept attacking. Still, of course, these cards are kind of risky against the white deck because you know your white deck has access to the Swords and the Disenchants. Doing absolutely nothing here, just letting Thomas take the damage from his own Surrender. He's going to drop to 5, finding a Mishra's Factory there. So Thomas is slowly coming back, but I think he's too low already. You never know in Magic, of course. There is a pass. Going to look at the first three cards. Put one back. Two back, actually. Not taking an extra one. Interesting. I mean, I'm still on 16. Finding a forest. Do I have a hurricane, perhaps? I'm playing one hurricane. That would be ideal right now, because a hurricane can kill my opponent and can take care of the surrender. Not that that matters anymore when my opponent's dead, but still. And Thomas here going to four, and Thomas still doesn't have a double blue, so he cannot play out his counter spells or mana drains. Again, just choosing to keep to take one card, going to two cards in hand, and I'm probably just gonna pass here. It's exactly what I do. So I think that means that Thomas is gonna go to three and just really slowly kill himself on his own surrender here in this game. We'll just have to wait and see. Well, it looks like I am doing something, though. I'm going to attack with everything. Okay, I thought I passed a turn, but I did not. I'm just going to attack here. Mishra's Factory, Argovian Pixies, and the Lanawar Elves. So I was a little bit into tank, I guess. There we see an animation. Now, upon animation, I want to respond. Probably got... Do I have a crumble from the sideboard? There's a crumble from the sideboard. Taking care of that, so I do that before blocking, of course, so that means he doesn't block with it, he doesn't gain any life because the casting cost is zero. He's blocking my Argovian Pixies, that means three points of damage, he's going to go to one, pass turn, and that's the end of the road. Wow, so these games have been very Surrendip Afrit dominated. Game one, we see Thomas wipe the floor with me with his Surrendip army, and game two, a Surrendip is what exec what kills himself. So it's a Surrendip suicide, you could say. Very interesting. Um, it's 1 1. That means we're going to go to game number three. Game number three, here we go. Thomas on the play, sitting on the left. It's 1 1, starting with a basic island and a pass. So at least no Moxen or Soul Rings or anything else, no ramping up. Good news for me, I guess. I'm starting with a Mishra's Factory and a pass. I do think Thomas is a slight favorite because he gets to start. It's as simple as that. If he can get just a big beefy creature on, there's a second blue. That's kind of nice. He can finally counter. I don't think I've seen him counter anything in these previous two games, despite the fact that he's playing with four counter spells, a mana drain, and a spell blast. Tapping two here. What am I gonna play? Or do I wanna attack? I'm a little bit into tank. It looks like I just want to attack here for two. So I changed my mind, gonna attack. Probably based on the fact that Thomas only has two blue out, so he doesn't have access to swords or disenchant because he doesn't have a white there on the battlefield. So with only blue, there's not much you can do against an active factory. Passing turn now to Thomas. So he's gonna draw his card for turn. Let's see what he can find. Going through his hand here. Okay, finding a Maze of If. That is actually really good against my deck. One of the reasons I'm playing the Ice Storms. I just want to keep attacking, so a Maze is annoying. I should probably, but I want to keep my green Stompy deck completely white bordered, but I was thinking a Maze of If would be really good in my deck as well. They're so good offensively also, because you can just attack with your small creatures, and you know when you don't like a block, you can just take your creature out of the combat situation. Finding a Pendlehaven into a Soul Ring. Do I have an Urnum Gin here? I mean, I can take the risk. If he's got it, he's got it. He's going to counter it away. If he doesn't, he doesn't. But I don't. I don't have an Urnum. Haven't seen an Urnum at all, by the way, in these matches so far. So there's an Argovian Pixies. Actually changing my mind, animating my factory and just going to attack with it. He's, I mean, he's got the maze, but there's a counter spell on the Argovian Pixies. And that kind of makes sense, because if you're Thomas, you want this game to take long. So, you know, all the threats, just counter them away if you can. And 
slowly start, you know, finding your big creatures and play them out. I mean, Trike is still this card that I'm really afraid of. He's got a one-off in his deck. If he can find it, it's going to be a big problem for me. There is a Mishra's Factory, which is also good for Thomas. But so far, things are looking good for him because I'm unable to put any real pressure on. He's still on 18. Finding a forest. Gonna tap, nope, untapping it again. A little bit in the tank here. Okay, playing a Sylvan. And, ooh, we're we gonna see another counter spell. There's a mana drain. So now we're really seeing that counter side of the deck of Thomas, and uh, that's very annoying for me because I would have loved to use. Ooh, there we see an ice storm on the Maze of If, probably. I've also animated my factory, so I'm gonna attack with the factory. Or not. No, I, no, I don't. I don't have enough mana to do that. Ah, that's annoying. Oh, that's annoying because I could have had that two points of damage. Really annoying, but it's also annoying that he countered my Sylvan. I wonder, maybe I should have played Ice Storm first that he could counter the Ice Storm. Nice. Brain guys are after a Mana Drain. It's such a good play. So he can use the extra mana he got from the Mana Drain for his Brain Geyser. So now he's drawing three cards off of that Brain Geyser. That is really good for Thomas. I mean, things are not looking good for me. The only thing that I'm happy about, ooh, he doesn't find the land drop, is that he doesn't find the land drop here and that he's, he doesn't have any white sources yet. So hopefully for me, his hand is full of white and I can just start attacking like crazy right now. Tapping four, are we gonna see an Urnum? There, we're gonna see the Urnum Gen. Still have that Pendlehaven to animate my factory, attacking for two here. Tom is gonna drop to 16. Ooh, and this is now a problem for Thomas actually. He's got more cards than me. If he can just find a white source, I'm sure it's, his hand's full of like swords and plowshares and stuff like that. He can just take care of the Urnum and get control of the game again. Tapping two. Okay, finding a Chaos Orb. He's going to flip. Probably, yeah, flip on the Urnum. Is he going to hit? That's the big question. Yep, that's a hit. So the Urnum is a goner. So this is pretty good news for Thomas. I mean, the bad news for him is he still doesn't have a, a land drop, but at least he's able to orb flip the Urnum out of the match, which is pretty crucial here. Third game, because that would have meant four extra points of damage. And now at least I can, I'm gonna just attack with the factory, I guess, next turn. So he's gonna drop to 14 then. Only three cards in hand that Sylvan would have been so sweet. I mean, in hindsight, I think maybe I should have played the Ice Storm first, let him counter away the Ice Storm and then play the Sylvan. Because I can always use the Sylvan to find another Ice Storm. I'm playing four, four in the deck. It's not that it's like this holy one-off. Then again, it's of course really nice to have that Maze of F being taken care of. There we see another factory, so that means I can attack potentially for three because I can pump the factory now. It's exactly what I'm doing, dealing three points of damage. He's going to drop to... Ooh, he's dropping to 13. I thought he should drop. Oh, was he on 16? Anyway, not doing anything else. Yeah, he was on 16. Yeah, that's true, by the way. Anyway, uh, let's take a look. Ooh, we see another Felwar Stone. I was kind of afraid he would do something meaningful. Just finding Felwars. This must be very frustrating for Thomas. He just needs a white source, and that, that will probably give him control of the game. But if it's not happening, I mean, I'm going to turn all those creatures sideways. I'm going to keep attacking. I could attack for four points of damage here. Am I going to use my Sol Ring here to activate my Mistress Factories dealing four damage? He would go down to nine. Untapping my Sol Ring again. So I'm a little bit in the tank here trying to find out what the best uh, line of play is here. So I'm animating both, attacking for four. So that's pretty obvious, isn't it? So he's going to go to nine. Because he only has that Felwar Stone that can only make green mana. So he's dropping to 9 here. Okay. And then I've got a second main. Am I going to play something out? No, I'm not. Ooh. So I'm not really finding anything on my side as well. 
but at least I'm able to deal some damage with the factory, so I'm not complaining. Thomas tapping four. What are we going to see? A gem day tome, perhaps? There is a gem day tome. The problem here with the tome is it's a good card, but it's very slow. Like a tome is not great when you're under pressure. Of course, the tome is going to help Thomas here finding a white source. So I wonder if I have a crumble, if I should destroy it here. I mean, the downside is I'm giving four life to Thomas. But I think if I have a crumble, I should probably do it because I really don't want him to find a white source. First, I'm attacking for four. Always attack first and then second main, I can play my stuff. Then, oh, there's a giant growth. Do I have a berserk? Oh, there's a berserk winning this one. Oh, and look at that. Thomas only having access to one blue, having a spell blast in hand, but not enough mana to cast it successfully. So that means this is a classic Berserk win. And look at that hand of Thomas. Maybe he's going to show us. I'm quite sure it's full of white cards here. And uh, I just feel very, very lucky here, Thomas, with this match that you couldn't find a white source in, in game number three. And, and the type of decks, you know, this green Stompy, one of the things they're really, really good at is being consistent, you know, being a monocolor deck and of course punishing your opponent for having problems with mana, just kind of struggling on the draw. That's going to be lethal against these kind of super aggressive decks. Anyway, Thomas, thank you for bringing your deck to the table and also thank you for watching another episode right here on Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And that was the episode for today. And before you go, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things to help the channel out. The first thing is to like this episode, if you liked it, of course, but a thumbs up would really be appreciated. Also, leave a comment to this video. What did you think of both of these decks and uh, how lucky was I, right, in that game number three? Wow, I really dodged the bullet on that uh, on those white spells there. Anyway, um, the other thing you can do, the, the, the third thing you can do is share this video on your social. So if you like what you see, please help me grow the channel and uh, share it where you can again if you want to of course and then there's one last thing that you can do and that is you can become a patron of the show i already talked about it a little bit in the introduction the cool thing is that if you become a patron you get access to the timmy talks discord page that means you also have access uh, discord server i should say that means you also have access to the timmy talks online tournaments i i hold like little online events every other month or so or a couple of months and uh, it's just a lot of fun. We've got a really nice community, if I say so myself, and you can become a part of that. And it's not very expensive. It already starts with $1 a month. And most importantly is that money is used to support the channel. So all the money from Patreon is used to support Timmy Talk. So if you like the content, if you want me to keep making, doing what I'm doing, please consider becoming a financial supporter on Patreon. So, um, oh yeah, and one last thing, your name will also be mentioned in the end scroll at the end of every video if you become a patron. What end scroll? Well, this end scroll. Ich bin